Oh, glorious radiance. That's very beautiful. I think Austin or Lauren, you can put everyone on mute. Yeah. So the the so what we're going to be doing is um, we'll put you on mute um, for parts of it, but then we'll um, allow for options when you can um, join in the conversation. Um, we'll be asking sometimes for you to use chat and sometimes we'll definitely be interested in just like having a vocal conversation um, just to sort of switch it up. Um, but that's why we're putting it on mute right now. So um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Welcome to um, my TED Talk. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so we're going to be talking about Sadaka um, and Lauren is going to be sharing her screen um, with some visuals for us so that you're just not staring at my face the whole time. Hey, lovely. There we go. Cool. So um, the conversation is around Sadaka as justice. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about Sadaka meaning whether or not Sadaka means charity, whether or not Sadaka um, means something different from charity, or maybe um, if it means something a little deeper than what we consider charity um, and like sort of delving into some of those, those nuances between those words. So um, you can go next. <laughs> um, the way that um, I have sort of broken out this conversation is in four parts. So we'll be first talking about the biblical context of the word sadaka and um, where Jews um, get the practice of Sadaka. Then we will be talking about the rabbinic advancement. So how, um, especially in medieval times, um, rabbis had sort of deepened or um, broken out the nuances of what this means. Um, and then we will move into how we can really apply this to our modern experiences um, because the Bible and rabbinic era, they were very different from where we live now, right? So um, we sort of have to be, I'll steal the president's word, we have to be nimble <laughs> um, in the way in which we um, sort of take these to apply into our, our lived experiences. Um, and then the last portion, we will be sort of um, teasing out what we could imagine moving forward with um, the versions of Sadaka that we'll be talking about. So, yeah. Um, so before we begin, um, I do want to encourage that you ask questions. You can use the raise hand function um, if you would like, or you can just type in the chat. Um, I strongly suggest if you have a question, you ask it at that point, rather than trying to wait, because you might not remember it, or it might not seem um, as relevant, and I'd rather this be more similar to a conversation um, than get down, than not. Um, so, if you have a question, and I strongly encourage questions. Um, this is a Jewish space, so questions are strongly encouraged uh, to ask it and to ask it bravely, because you very well could not be like you could be one of many people with that question. Um, I will be using the word God, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to. Um, for a lot of people, the word God is like a very uncomfortable term, um, or they, they don't necessarily um, imagine God in the way in which um, we've been talking about God in the biblical sense. That's totally fine. Um, we're just, we're using the language that's provided to us. Um, so use whatever language works for you, and that's totally fine. And then also, this is just a disclaimer, is that this is really just one perspective, my perspective, and um, I have at the end, some sources that are sort of um, informing this perspective, but it's not the only one and it doesn't mean it's truth. Um, it's just a different way of thinking about things and um, hopefully you can also add your perspective. So, um, Some things you should know about me before we get started. Um, I am a reformed Jew. Um, so uh, I, for, for me, Reformed Judaism is about applying Judaism to my life in ways that make sense for me um, and being critical um, and asking questions and diving deep. So that's sort of where like my religious background comes is I'm a Reformed Jew. I'm not conservative. I'm not Orthodox. Um, I'm pretty solidly Reformed. Um, I have a social justice lens. I work in the Center for Ideas um, and Center for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Social Change. 
So I think a lot about social justice. I think a lot about um, oppression and uh, systems. So that almost always comes through in everything that I'm talking about. Um, I also um, am a Jewish liberation theologist. So um, I have a cat that's gonna come around here just so you know. <laughs> um, so Jewish liberation theology, um, similar to Christian liberation theology, it's a, a understanding of religious texts through the lens of liberation um, and how um, your religion is part and parcel to how you can free yourself from oppression, right? So um, I believe deeply that Judaism is a liberation um, religion and that, sorry, and that um, it speaks to the oppressed. So that's um, a pretty important bias or, or perspective for me. And finally, I am a critical theologist. Uh, I'm a sociologist and the sociological lens I take is a critical one. So I look at power structures, systems, um, to understand sort of the dynamics that people are moving in their world. So um, I don't necessarily, I'm not always super interested in the individual level as much as I'm interested in a larger super system, right? So those are things to know. <laughs> All right, so uh, I want to know a little bit about you. We actually already introduced our names and our pronouns, which is really exciting. Um, but in the chat, if you could type um, the reason why you came, like why are you interested in this? And be honest, if it's because you felt you had to or if you are actually interested, like I want to know all of that. So I'll give you like a few minutes, a few, a few minutes, I guess, to, to type it out. This is awesome. I'm loving these answers. It's really exciting to see people who are um, open to learning and um, wanting to expose themselves to new perspectives. So that's exciting. Cool. Awesome. All right, we want to move on as people keep typing. People can keep typing. All right. So we have a little bit of a poll um, that I believe Austin is going to, uh, yeah. Um, so I just, we, we thought it'd be nice to know how confident you feel to talk about Sadaka. Um, I guess I'll just give it like two minutes, uh, you know, well, I guess, or I guess until we get to 100%, that would be the best, right? <laughs> um, so like, I really wanted to know this um, just to sort of get an idea of um, where we're starting in the conversation. I have absolutely no problem starting at the very basic beginning. Um, but I also, you know, if we have a lot of people who are very confident in the, in the topic, um, I don't want to bore you, right? So. Yay. Looks like about 75% right now, 80. We're getting closer. Looks like maybe one more answer. We'll give it just a couple more seconds. All right, cool. If that's me, I didn't feel like I should. 
Oh, that makes sense. I'm an outlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're probably good then. <laughs> All right. So um, that's good to know. Um, I am going to probably start um, at a little more of a basic level to make sure that um, we have everybody um, sort of at the same, the same starting point. Um, I'm, it's totally fine to not be confident about a new topic. That's actually excellent that you guys have taken a brave step to come and talk about something you don't know very much about or you don't feel super confident talking about. So thank you so much for taking that. All right. Okay, so we're going to start with the biblical context. Um, and what I mean is, um, how did we start thinking about Sadaka in terms of the way in which it was originally used in Torah, right? Um, so um, first, before we do that, though, uh, we should really talk about what Sadaka means um, and, and like sort of how we get to that meaning. So um, Sadaka, the word Sadaka. And I have a little plug in here. I'm not a Hebrew expert. I don't speak Hebrew fluently. Um, I know Hebrew well enough to get by in shul. Um, so if you are interested in Hebrew, we have Hebrew classes on campus and you should study Hebrew. Um, and you should reach out to people who have a lot more knowledge about it, like Cantor Abbey, right? Um, but this is my basic understanding of the word sadaka. So um, sadaka um, has a root. Um, in Hebrew, um, um, words are made out of roots. So the root is the sadi dalek uf, kuf. And um, that root three letters um, usually translates to like just, not like I just wanted something, but like righteous, right? Just, right and clear. Um, and there's some other words that we have um, that are very similar with the same root. So sadaka is one, sadik is another, sadik and sadikim. And so these are all words that are related to that particular root, just right clear, okay? So sadaka is a noun. Um, sadik is also a noun. <laughs> um, so um, sadik is a is a person, so it's also, it's a noun, but it's a person. Um, and um, so sadaka is often translated as charity or charitable acts, right? Um, but the, the root, just right clear, when translated into sadik means justice. So um, that's a really different understanding of that root, charity and justice. And we will talk about why those are really different. Um, in the English, right? So this, the important thing to note is that that is an English translation of a word. And when you're thinking in a Hebrew context, that's a, that's a totally different meaning making scenario than when you're thinking in an English context. So we are, anytime that you translate, you're, you're losing a little bit of something, right? So that's why it's important to keep that in mind that we're, we're working through that. Cool. All right. So that's the word. Um, and now you can, you can go to the next part. Yeah. So um, where do we see Sadaka, charitable giving, right, um, happening in Torah? Um, and I took out one very famous portion of, <laughs> um, of Torah to talk about this, and that's Leviticus. Um, and I use the, um, and I didn't put this in my resources and I probably should have. I use my Tanakh that is the, JPS, I think is what it's called, the JPS Tanakh. It's like a big brown Tanakh <laughs> that I have. Um, and it has the Hebrew and the transliteration right next to it. And again, this is a transliteration or a translation of, of, the, of the Hebrew. So every translation is a little different than, than what it actually, like you can never get a perfect translation. Um, but my translation says, and when you reap the harvest of the land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. Um, so, um, so we are seeing in Leviticus, this is a, a portion of, of Torah that is talking about laws, right? And talking about how 
to um, structure society and how to uh, relate and interrelate with each other. Um, so this is a, a portion that's talking about how you use your, and, and at the time, harvesting and land and food as an agrarian society, these were very important, very uh, like wealthful portions of the society. So how you used your land and how you interacted with each other when it came to your food was a very important way to like lay a base or a, an understanding of, of society. So when it comes to poor people and when it comes to what are called strangers, right? Um, the idea being that you should be hospitable, you should be caring for them, um, for those who don't have what you have, right? Um, so we don't, we're not all farmers now. So it's like a little further away from us, but because this was an agrarian society, talking about food and harvest, um, it really went to the heart of, of how you gained wealth, right? And how, who, was, who was a have and a have not in the society? So that's really where we start like starting to think about charitable giving, um, charitable giving, I should say. So next. So um, I want to break this down a little bit more when we talk about charity versus sadaka um, and why I sort of push back a little bit on the translation of charity. So <clears throat> Um, so sadaka comes, like we said, from that root um, and that is similar to sedic, right? So justice. So righteousness, equitable, just, those words. Charity, charity has a root from Latin, from caritas, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, and it means virtuous, altruistic, or generous, right? Um, those, of course, we, both of those things are very good right? But they are not the same. And that's important to note. They're not the same. Um, and so why do we have sadaka and sedic as something that is righteous, equitable, and just? Where do we get that from in Torah? We're talking about Leviticus. We're talking about commandments, right? We're talking about mitzvot. Um, so we're talking about the things that are required of Jews to do to maintain society. Um, it's not it's not voluntary. Um, Sadaka is not a voluntary act. It is required of a Jew. It's part of mitzvot. Um, so it's, oblig it's an obligatory thing. It's commanded and it's duty bound, right? Though that's a really different thing though than what charity comes out of. So charity is coming out of this virtuous, altruistic, generous line of thinking, which derives from a theology of holy love. And like, we always think about love in terms of sort of like a, a romantic, uh, f like flowery sort of feeling. But holy love, right, is this idea, it's, uh, it's emotional. Um, it's an emotional attachment to God. Um, it's intimate. It's an intimate, very close attachment to divinity. And it's all about our, our morality. When we talk about virtues in a Christian context, it's like a virtue versus um, um, a vice, right? Uh, the virtues, the, charity is one of the large virtues in a Christian theology. So um, they're both really important to different perspectives, but I, I really don't think of them as the same thing, right? One is being um, an expectation of you to do regardless of your particular um, personality, right? Um, but holy love is really about um, a choice you're making to cleave to God, right? To you, you're doing this out of a virtuous, moral, intimate relationship, right? Um, Jews have to do mitzvot regardless of whether or not you um, have a strong relationship to God, right? Um, I, and that's really a very different way of of interacting with your religion, right? Um, so, so that's why I. I I tend to shy away from calling sadaka charity, right? And I prefer to just use the word sadaka as it's as a word that that stands on its own, um, and to create a meaning in my head that is it is word to meaning rather than word translation meaning, right? So that's that's why I kind of broke those those things down. So. 
So we have that rabbinic um, advancement coming up. Um, so we just talked about that biblical portion. And before we go into the rabbinic portion, does anybody have any questions or things that they'd like to um, sort of fuss out a little bit more? You can raise your hand or you can type in the chat. If you raise your hand, we'll probably ask you to go on video. We're good? We're all good? All right, excellent. Fabulous. Okay, so in the rabbinic era, um, we have a lot. So the great, one of the things that I love about Judaism um, is that it is a constant living, breathing thing that we add to and that we augment. Um, and um, great thinkers throughout the ages have really like dove deep into the, the works and seen things that um, I probably never would have seen because I'm not a great thinker like they are, right? But like, they'll take like even the smallest little portion of, of Torah and they can make a whole book out of it, right? Like it's, it's amazing. So um, one of the things, one of the great thinkers of the day, um, Ramban or Mahmanis, um, he, excellent Sephardic Jew, um, of the medieval times, he devised this whole system to talk about Sadaka, right? He's like, okay, it's not just good enough for us to talk about it in this one little portion. We need to really think about the nuances and the details about giving, um, which like, you know, like, let's get down to the nitty gritty of like, what does it mean if you give, but you don't give enough, like, or what does it mean if you give a lot, but um, you do it for, for recognition, right? Like all of these different things. So he devised eight levels of sadaka, and depending on who you're talking to, these will change a little bit, again, because he did not do this in English, right? We are translating once again. Um, <laughs> um, but, and, and sometimes people will, will flip the way the levels go, so they'll start with level one as the lowest, but I started with level eight as the lowest, okay? So the first level, level eight, right, the lowest level, is to give out of pity or out of sadness or begrudgingly. And those are three different translations. And I thought it was important to put all three so you could understand that um, there's a, a difference of thought in the way in which that means, what that means. And they all mean something very different, right? So to give out of pity means to give because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he wrote in Hebrew and Judaic Arabic, which is, he also had a lot of thoughts about Islam. He's a He's an excellent thinker. Um, so he, to give out of pity is to give from a sense of superiority, right? To feel like you already have something, you feel bad for the other person, and you're going to try and make yourself feel a little better by giving to them, right? Um, to give out of sadness is to give because you have empathized with the person, and you feel bad about their situation, um, and you want to help them a little bit more. And to give begrudgingly means that you're giving because you have to, but you're not really happy about it and you're just being very reluctant around it. So those three different things um, sort of constitute the first, the lowest level, right? Um, and it's really important to know even the lowest level is still a mitzvot. Um, so the idea is not necessarily, oh, like you just gave it the lowest level, like you, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah. You still fulfilled it, um, but it's always important to know that there's room for improvement, right? So the next level, to give graciously, but not to give enough, right? To give happily or willingly, but you didn't give enough. So um, you, you maybe you had, let's say you had $10 to give, but you only gave eight of them, right? Or like if you ever notice like people who tip um, and they like they could tip 20%, but they only tip 15%, right? Like they were happy to give the 15, but they probably should have given the 20. Um, the next level is to give enough, but only after being asked, right? Is to, um, uh, to, to give it, but like you have to, like you're waiting for somebody to approach you. Um, the next is to give, before being asked or in anticipation. So you see somebody's need and you give without asking, without them even approaching you. Um, the next is to give without knowledge of the recipient. Hey, Marco. 
<laughs> um, <clears throat> to give without knowledge of who you're giving to, but they definitely know who you are. So public giving, right? Um, so like um, you might have given to, like you might be at like a celebrity, let's say, and people know that you gave to this foundation or, or these people. Um, <clears throat> The next is to give with, with knowledge of the recipient, so you know who they are, but you don't take credit for that, for that giving. So that might be something where like, if you've ever seen people like do like a, like a drop off DoorDash, right? Um, so like in the country, a lot of people grow zucchini and um, they have too many zucchini. And so what they'll do is they'll take their zucchini in the middle of the night and they'll like drop it off on their neighbor's doors, right? They don't know who, who gave that zucchini like people wake up and they're like, ah, I have zucchini. Um, but the person who dropped it off knows exactly who they're giving it to, right? Um, the next level, the, the second to highest level is to give anonymously to an unknown recipient. So neither people know, it's a double blind give. Um, and then the last level, the, the highest level is to provide a, for a person the means to become self-sufficient. And there are lots of different ways in which which Ramban talks about that. It could be a no interest loan. It could be <clears throat> creating a structure that um, prevents one from falling into poverty. There's lots of different ways in which one could help somebody become self-sufficient, right? To help somebody not need Sadaka in the first place. So the reason why we start thinking about these levels is not to make you feel bad about the way in which you're giving, but it's to help you to interrogate how are you, how are you interacting with your community, right? And are you, are you doing things that will help them to thrive? How are you moving your community past survival, right? So that's a really exciting concept to me. And I think like the fact that like this was in the medieval times, like that's pretty radical to think about. Um, that even at that point when, and in the medieval times, we're talking about people that still thought like, that, that like authority was, was, was a divine thing from kings. And like, I mean, like there's so much really bizarre stuff that happens in the med medieval times um, that we really would never um, co-sign today. But to see like, this is a, a, a philosophy that was happening at the same time, it's pretty exciting. Um, and it's, it's really um, important for thinking about the way in which we today um, start to interact and um, work together as our community, right? So, cool. Does anyone have any questions about those? Those ladders, the ladder of, of Sadaka? No? Can you think about different ways in which this might be applied? I know um, I was talking with a friend who was asking things like, Oh, um, what if like you um, put something out on social media to help people, um, but you do it because you want to get clout, right? Like where, what level is that, <laughs> right? Like, the, like you don't have to think about this in terms of like an agrarian society or like a medieval society. There are ways in which we can think about how do we actually like interact with each other today, right? Cool. Uh, I have a question, I think, is that- yes. So like, I mean, I'm still sort of like, I'm still thinking it through. I don't fully have it That's thought okay. out. But like, is this, is this responsibility extended to everyone or just Jewish people? Excellent question. Excellent question. So we talk about this a lot. Um, so when this was written, right, um, and depending on um, the translation and depending on the perspective of the person, that last level might be specifically about Jews, right? How to help a Jew become self-sufficient. I, again, I come from a reform egalitarian perspective um, and I don't live in just a Jewish society, right? And none of us do. Um, so it doesn't make sense for me personally to see this in a, in a view where I'm only helping Jews. Um, and I think for most modern day Jews, the way in which they're thinking about um, interacting with their community, it goes beyond just the Jewish community, right? It has to go into the communities, all of the communities that they live in. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you think about the, the direct translation, it was like providing a Jew 
but um, it's also important to note that um, when we're talking about biblical, like the biblical context, um, the Jew, the stranger, um, what that really means, um, that, and that's like a whole different conversation. <laughs> so I don't want to like get too much off on a, on a tangent, but that that is a whole um, legal uh, description about a person and their rights, right? So much in the same way in which um, we talk about in American, uh, the constitution talking about free people, right? And who, who really were free people, who were they thinking about? Um, and how we've sort of expanded that, that legal category, the same has happened here. Thanks. Cool. No problem. All right, next, we will move on to modernity, where we live now. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about how to apply this to our own lives, um, and also to think about the ways in which we might um, change it a little bit or augment it or um, see if there are other ways to think about this. So um, it, we, we don't stay static, right? Like we should be a dynamic thinker and, and sort of mauling around with the, the ideas in our head, wrestling with it. So cool. Next. Yeah. All right. So um, some ways in which I think about Sadaka today, um, and these are like three of many different ways. So the first way is the way that we almost always imagine Sadaka as money. And the reason we think about it is because we live in a capitalist society, right? And the basis of our wealth is money. That's the basis of, of how we get our food, how we get our, our housing, everything is through money. Um, and so that's of course our first, our go-to is that we could give money. And I strongly suggest giving money when you can, right? But we also, like I said, I'm a critical theorist. So I'm also thinking about the ways in which you could give without money, right? Um, we have a huge income gap right now in um, our, the trajectory of our society. And even people, I mean, even when we think about the fact that yes, we, um, those who are poor in our country are still rich in comparison to other countries, um, it's, you can't do a comparison and think that that's okay. Like they're still poor in comparison to where they live, right? So, um, so how can we give to our community um, when so few of us have the, the monetary resource to do that, right? So there are other ways in which you can give um, that are just as important. Um, so you can give your labor and your expertise um, I know as a teacher, this is one of the things that uh, I struggled with is whether or not I should be getting paid for my, um, my expertise in um, social justice or um, if that was an immoral or like a, an unethical sort of, of transaction, if I should just be giving it to the betterment of my society. Um, and I landed, of course, on a this is a both and sort of situation. Um, but you can give your labor, you can give your, your, your expertise on something right now. Um, I have a picture of people sewing uh, because we live in a time where a lot of people who have the expertise of seamstressing are using it, their own free time, their own free material, well, I mean, it's not free materials, but their own materials and giving to others, right? Giving it out to those without asking for anything in return. Um, so if you have like a skill, skills are very important um, for, for helping other people um, that they might not have. And it might be that you're teaching that skill so that they could have it in the future, right? And you're doing that self-sustaining portion of Sadaka. You could also give time, space, or voice. Um, and this one is um, very interesting. Is like, we often think about giving time um, as, um, you know, like giving, like, I'll talk to you later, sort of a situation, right? Like, I'll leave your presence. Um, and that can definitely be a thing that you can do. But when you say give time or space or voice, you could also be elevating time for somebody else. You could be elevating a space for somebody else, making space for them, right? So that might mean in your position or your job in the future, um, that rather than you speaking at a meeting, you give that space to somebody whose voice has been silenced. It could mean um, that when you're doing um, hiring practices, that you're thinking about the different perspectives that are outside of your own. 
and infusing it into your hiring practices, right? Um, it could mean, and it often means for a lot of people, um, that you are trying to, as a community, move towards a more inclusive perspective. And you're thinking about all of these people who are on the margins and how can you center them, right? In your community at that time. So time, space, and voice is a very important way to give to your community because it develops the community in um, ways that like you weren't expecting it to, right? Because you're introducing diversity into, into the voice. So, of course, we're gonna talk about COVID-19. <laughs> um, and I've given some examples of ways in which you can use those different um, time, voice, space, labor, expertise, money, wealth in the current pandemic that we're in. So one way you can use your money or your wealth um, I know that all of us are thinking deeply about the struggle of our businesses, of our small businesses. I know in Ithaca, um, one of my favorite things about Ithaca is that it is a hub of delicious restaurants and I don't want them to go out of business. So, you know, finding ways to buy a gift card from them or um, to support businesses that are still open um, in some way, right? Or you could, of course, as we know, donate to people in need, donate to hospitals, donate to um, homeless shelters, making sure that you are putting your money in places that will further your values, right? Living in your values. Um, like I said, with labor and expertise, you could be sewing masks for somebody. I'm doing that personally because I can sew. Um, but if you can't sew, right, you could make food for somebody. Um, I've done that as well. Like I've dropped off food, um, like a no contact drop off at my friend's house who, who would need food. Not everybody knows or like how to cook. Um, before this, we often talked about the convenience of cooking um, as like a luxury right now, the time you have, the expertise you have, the money to go and get the food. Um, and so we have all of these people who don't have those skills to make good food for themselves, requiring themselves to eat. And like a lot of people are having struggle meals. So thinking about how you could give those expertise, that expertise, teaching somebody how to cook would be really excellent. Um, and then time, space, and voice. Practicing social distancing is absolutely sadaka to me, right? Um, making sure that you are doing the best you can to keep other people healthy, to keep them sustained, that's so important. Um, and then of course, elevating a medical uh, voice, elevating the medical advice um, rather than giving into misinformation or, um, you know, thinking about um, all of these weird conspiracies going on right now, right? Because we're trying, like our wheels are turning and we have to find reason and meaning in everything. Um, thinking about what it is that our doctors and our nurses and our researchers are saying about COVID-19 and, and really like giving that the weight that it deserves, right? So those are different ways in which you could, in our current situation, do COVID-19 or do Sadaka from your own home, right? So um, I thought maybe we could chat a little bit about other ways you could practice Sadaka. There are lots of different ways we can do this. This does not have to be um, just the ways that I said. So if you have a way that you would like to share with people, please let us know in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Yes, communicate with your family and friends. I know that a lot of people are struggling with their mental health right now, um, especially when you think about um, people who are um, really extroverted and are, are need a lot of social interaction. This is very difficult for them. And rather than um, telling them, you know, just like suck it up or whatever, um, being, really mindful and empathetic to like that struggle um, and recognizing that just because like I might be having a great time in social isolation or social, social distancing that this could be incredibly isolating for other people in 
damaging ways, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can, so I know that there are, um, I'm in a, a group called uh, Tompkins Mutual Aid on Facebook, um, which is all about trying to get um, need to the people that need it, right? Um, and talking about the resources that are available if you need it. So um, Cantor Abbey mentioned also the Tompkins County Immigrate, Immigrants Rights Coalition, um, which is an excellent way to give time, money, um, to to a cause you can donate clothing um i know that my boss right now he's like he's like a very minimalist person and so he's like getting rid of clothes um to give to others which is an excellent thing i know that on campus um when we get back we're gonna get back <laughs> um the um the career center has a, a clothes a professional clothes donation space um to give clothes to people who might need um, professional clothes for interviews and things as you guys get ready for graduation. Um, so if you can't afford to buy a suit, which I recall very, very vividly, the expense that buying professional clothes for interviews was like out of my budget. So when I heard that they were doing that, I thought that was excellent. And um, I plan to, that's part of my spring plan is to go through my clothes and give to that. So yeah. Um, all right, cool. I love all of these answers. You guys are geniuses. Oh. <laughs> all right. So um, I wanted to give a different perspective. Uh, what time is it? Ooh, we have time, right? For like a three minute video. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yes, we do. Awesome. So, um, so the next slide is a different, it's a similar, but different perspective. Um, so this is from Bim Bomb, which is for children and I still love it. Okay. <laughs> um, um, and I like, I'm of the age in which a lot of my, my friends have, have kids. So I watch a lot of Bim Bomb, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, Rabbi uh, Ruttenberg is talking about um, Chas Chasid, Sadaka, and Sedek, and like sort of the differences between it um, and the nuances between it. It's excellent. So let's watch her. I think if you just click it, it will work. It is not. Oh, great. Cool, cool, cool. Um, um, hang on one second. Let me cool. see. I'm also going to try looking for the link. <laughs> it worked on my computer, I swear. I checked like 15 times. I think it's because I'm sharing this. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. I do not know. If you give us one second, yeah. um, we can find the actual link and then share it. Looks yeah. like Abby just popped it into the chat. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to stop my share for one second and then start a new one. Yeah. Thank you, Cantor Abby. Yes. I, I think Bim Bam is for everyone. You know, there is content that's good for kids, but it's- We all want to be helpful. Generally, to really people in need, but there are a lot of <laughs> yeah I, I i think i definitely i definitely frequent the the kids section of bim bum a lot so. uh -oh. is it not working i mean i can also just break it down but i love listening to my remember, it's so. a great video yeah oh yay Maybe? Yeah, cool. One way to address this problem would be to give so one way that we could address this problem would be to give someone food. This would be an act of chesed, an act of loving kindness. It is voluntary and it's individual. That means we choose to give something over to someone else out of a feeling of personal motivation or personal connection. Um, other acts of chesed might involve bringing a lasagna to a friend who's just had a baby and is feeling overwhelmed or visiting someone who's sick. It's not necessarily only for someone who has a need 
that is greater than your own, but it's an act of, of loving kindness and, and caring for someone else. Another way that we could help hungry people would be to donate money. Donating money in the Jewish tradition is called tzedakah, and it's obligatory. We are obligated to offer some of our financial resources to those who are in need. And it really only counts if you're giving money to people who really, really need your help. And furthermore, the great Jewish sage Maimonides said that the highest form of tzedakah is helping a person become self-sufficient. To take one example, to donate money to a food bank so that they could offer food to those who are in need. Um, this money could go potentially to buy groceries, but it could also go to pay the food bank's electricity bill or rent. There's a third option though. We also could ask, why are there hungry people in the world? What needs to change in order to make that not be the case? Do we need to reallocate money in our state or federal budget so that people who are close to poverty don't go over the edge? Do we need to pass new regulations to make housing more affordable? Do we need to raise the minimum wage so that people who are working full time are able to actually take care of all of their needs? In what ways do racism or sexism or homophobia contribute to people falling into poverty or staying in poverty? The path of tzedek, of justice, is that of trying to create a better world by changing the systems and structures that cause inequality. To understand these systems better, take a look at this picture. In the first one, everybody has the same supports, but that doesn't mean that they can all see the ball game because the system for keeping people out impacts different people in different ways. In the second picture, you see that everybody has the supports that they need in order to access the thing that they're trying to get. So that, at very minimum, is the aesthetic perspective. It's trying to change the systems so that everybody has a chance to get in. But it can go even further. Have a look at this third picture. Here, instead of making the system more accessible to everybody, they're dismantling the system entirely. The real work of Sedek is about changing systems that keep people out so that we don't even need to worry about having supports to bolster people a little bit here and a little bit there. What would this look like with regards to poverty and hunger in America? Those are the questions that Sedek asks and seeks to answer. We need people to help make sure that the needs of today are being addressed. Chesed and tzedakah are important, important pieces of that project. But if we don't ask why those needs are there in the first place, injustice will continue to be perpetuated. Pursuing tzedek is an essential part of our work for a more just world. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so as you can see, um, the way that she broke it down, um, those individual acts, chesed, the structural acts, tzedek, tzedakah being in the middle, for me, that highest level of tzedakah, the self-sustaining level, that it's like, it's like a, an upward hill. That is when you start to hit justice. Right, that's when you start getting sedic. Um, and so I'm always turning my eye toward that highest level of sadaka. How can I help everyone else to move into sedic? How can I push us beyond the individual level and thinking about how can we all be self sustaining, right? Um, so that's that's sort of like how I, I read that that excellent bim bam video. <laughs> So, cool. Um, there's, I think, two more slides. Maybe. There we go. Cool. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, um, how do I think about this? How do I think about those? Uh-oh. It, like, disappeared. We'll go right back to it. Don't worry. Also, I hope you guys like all of the beautiful um, nature that I put into my PowerPoint. I felt we needed a little calming situation. <laughs> um, so um, the way in which I started thinking about this, um, the personal, that chesed, is things like mutual aid, right? Or person-to-person -person acts that fill a crisis, act, uh, crisis gap. So the things that we're doing because the crisis has happened and you have to attend to the situation at hand, 
right? You can do GoFundMes, sew-a-thons, those random acts of kindness, ways in which you can really help the individual with whatever their need is at that moment. That sadaka though is more similar to like a movement. Um, it's about joining together to stop that cause before, like, like stop the crisis as it's happening. So the way in which um, Poor People's Campaign is going around trying to lobby for policy change, right? The policy hasn't changed, but we're saying it has to change, right? It has to stop. Um, debt forgiveness can also be considered part of that um, movement portion, right? Um, and then once we finally get to Sadaka, it's a culture shift. It's changing the way in which we actually interact with each other on a base level. So it's embedding justice into our policies to prevent crisis, right? We're already infusing it into the way in which our society is woven together. So that means having healthcare that works, that that saves people. It means having wages that are livable, um, that speak to the dignity of person and work. It means having housing that's accessible um, rather than you know thinking about things in terms of a negative. Um, it's thinking about how can we all be together and feel cohesive as a society, right? So, excellent. <laughs> cool. All right, so if you have any questions or you want to uh, come off, off um, uh, mute, um, this is definitely a time to do so. Um, that is, I have, after the slide, there is a resource um, slide for those who are interested in reading more. I wanted to do a little bit of plugging for books. I don't have books on there for, for the most part, um, except for the Tanakh. <laughs> um, but I wanted, if you were interested in reading more about um, the underpinnings of Jewish theology, um, I have a book called A Jewish Theology that uh, one of my rabbis gave to me um, that really helps you to um, sort of suss through the different Jewish thoughts and how they um, interact with the world. Excellent book. Um, I also have Toward a Jewish Theology of Liberation. Um, this book is kind of old, it's from the 80s, but like it's excellent still, um, and it's by Mark Ellis, um, and he sort of goes through um, how you can take an oppression uh, view or like an anti-oppression view through a Jewish theological um, lens. So if you are interested in actual like hard copy books, these are ones that you could do. Um, easily you could pick them up on um, any of your locally sourced bookstore sites. Um, but I also have links over here so that if you are um, not interested in buying things that you could still read about um, Sadaka a little bit more. So. Oh yeah, sorry, Kendra, Eddie, thank you for that. Yeah, the Hebrew Bible, Tanakh. <laughs> so. I also want you to know you can always just reach out to me. Uh, my Instagram is open. Um, Thank you um, for that. And you can reach us at Center for Ideas or you can just email me personally. Um, I know that a lot of people might have questions but they don't wanna ask it in front of other people. I strongly suggest you do, but if you don't want to, it's okay, so. I just wanna say, Omega, you gave us a real gift of Sadaka today by sharing your expertise. Um, you. This was beautifully crafted, came at a time when we should all be asking ourselves, how can we knock down that wall? Because yeah. um, we have a moment that we're in right now, um, for sure. Um, I'm, I know that um, you know some people might have to go, but I wanna just say, we'll, we'll just hang out here yeah. for a while now. Um, and 